Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Lure, and I'm excited to connect with my good buddy, Paul Berger, today in Dubai. Welcome to the podcast, Paul. Hi, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation here about A, your interesting career, which you've been having. You're nearly three decades in the Middle East in Dubai as a, both an entrepreneur and, of course, a business operator there. And, of course, your you know, direct involvement in motorsports and now, of course, in the arena group business, which is an integrated event solutions provider and the opportunities and challenges which come with this, of course, also linked to COVID. So we got a lot of interesting subjects to cover. And uh, let's get right, dive right in there because, you know, as far as I know, you were really an advertising man, right? Coming out of the, in the advertising world, growing up there in the late 80s, 90s. And in London, Let, let's start there. And then how did you land in Dubai? Um, you know, the first early parts there of your career. Absolutely, Marcus. Yeah, thank you. It makes me feel a, lot, a bit old thinking how long I've been here. But uh, I certainly had no intention of coming over to, to Dubai and the Middle East for, for more than three years in the beginning. And look, uh, as you say, yeah. nearly, nearly three decades later, yeah. I'm still here. So look, yeah, look, I was, uh, I was working in my 20s, you know, in London, doing a mixture of things, just trying to find, find my way in life, I guess. I was, uh, did a lot of work in advertising below the line in those days. There was no digital or internet in those days. We were focused on effectively direct marketing, you know, sales promotion, yeah. what they used to refer to as, you know, below the line uh, in, in the old sort of advertising yeah. spiel then. And also in sales as well. So I was, uh, you know, worked in publishing and really, as I said, just trying to find my feet and, You know, as I approached, uh, you know, my, my late 20s, I wanted to come out to the Middle East. I wanted to leave London. And I was very fortunate to pick up campaign one day and saw an advertisement for an account director in Dubai for BBDO, Impact right. BBDO, as they were. Then. Yeah. And, and I was fortunate to be offered that job and that role. And uh, I packed my bags, uh, said goodbye to everybody. And, and I landed, you know, solo in Dubai in 1993 working for BBDO as a, a regional uh, account director. In those days, in the 90s, all the sort of the, the advertising global event, uh, agency world were moving to Dubai. That was, they were moving from Lebanon, from Beirut, from Cyprus, uh, and their headquarters were all being sort of set up in Dubai. Dubai became yeah. the advertising marketing capital, if you will, of, mm. of the Middle East. And I was very fortunate to be part of that with one of the leading agencies and um, worked uh, immediately on Pepsi-Cola, which is the main BBDO account globally. Right. And, and then Emirates Airline was, was an account that we, uh, that we won. And I also worked a little bit on, on General Motors. And I was effectively the account director responsible for all the sort of the non-TV side, the non-press side. The, we would did the exciting stuff. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it. For, right. for, that was my first sort of two or three years stint in Dubai. Yeah. Um, and was it mostly focused on the Dubai market or was it already regionally, you know, running around into all the other sort of neighboring countries? It was mainly Dubai. Uh, Dubai was, it was uh, growing massively in those days. Uh, Emirates Airline had, had only been launched three or four years earlier. You know, I think it was only flying to 10 destinations at that time. So it was very new. Mm. Um, London was the biggest. But yeah, it was all about uh, with Emirates getting, it wasn't so much of a hub then in those days. It was, uh, it was generally local, I would call local, you know, Dubai marketing and advertising and all our promotions and things were directed to a sort of a local audience. But that's, that's where it all kicked off. And that was my first you know, foray into, uh, into, into the Middle East yeah. world of, of, of advertising. Yeah. Love it. Amazing. Yeah. Now, somehow, yeah. obviously, you know, in a couple of years down the road here, you started um, what, what you describe it as a leisure karting business. Um, and, mm. you know, and that also linked, of course, to street races um, in the region, you know, mm. Dubai, Abu Dhabi, etc. cetera. Do you always had a thing for motorsports or, or how did that all start? What, what, uh, where does the passion for that or, or the, the business then come into, came into? Well, not really. I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I was a petrol head. But, you know, after two or three years working in advertising, I really enjoyed, I enjoyed my time in Dubai. I was enjoy, but I, wasn't, I wanted to get out of the advertising world. Um, I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to, to leave Dubai. I was, I was settled. And 
at that time in in London, uh, karting was a big thing, and in particular, you know, corporate karting, leisure karting in London. Uh, there was some some fantastic. Uh, karting tracks at Daytona and, and Chelsea Harbour and, and all these places. And they were very, very successful. So it wasn't because I was, as I said, a crazy, crazy about motor racing, but I just wanted to set up my own business and do something very different. And, and in the mid nineties, in the middle East, there was no motorsport. There was, there was what I set up, which was leisure karting and there was desert rallying, which is, we know, which Mohammed bin Salem, um, you know, the, the, uh, the Middle East rally champion was leading. Mm -hmm. and, and what he did in the desert, I was doing on the karting track. There were no motor racing facilities in Abu Dhabi, uh, Qatar, Bahrain, Dubai. There was nothing. Right. Um, and there was a huge gap. And, and so I started off this leisure karting business in Dubai. I started off with the indoor. We then started organizing these amazing twin engine uh, street races where we would you know, we launched actually in 1996 at the very first Dubai Shopping Festival. And, and to kick it off, I was uh, with Emirates. We made a movie and we got the cast of, uh, of Baywatch oh, uh, nice. to fly over uh, from LA to do a promotional video on Dubai and to do a promotional video on Emirates. And they participated, you know, in the 24 hour race. So we had um, the guy from Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Uh, okay. We we had uh, Yasmin. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It was not. Was it who? Um, Alfonso Ribeiro. Oh, right, okay. We we had uh, Yasmin Bleeth uh, from Baywatch, and we just had a, we had uh, yeah, just a host of uh, okay. of stars that came over that drove in the race. We had. And um, this is twenty four hours karting, not. Uh, so basically, these are twin engine carts right, um, yeah. that go 120 kilometers, you know, with your bum about you yeah. know an inch off the ground, off yeah, the asphalt, yeah. fly around the streets. They were, they were specially designed tracks on the streets of a city. Right. And uh, they were sort of two, two and a half kilometer mo uh, motor racing tracks. Yeah. We would have 50, 50 of these racing on the circuit at the same time. Wow. And nonstop. So it was, it was like a relay. So drivers would, if you were fit, you would drive for two hours, then you come in to refuel, yeah. and then they would change drivers. So the, yeah, the top sure. teams had four or five drivers. And it was 24 hours all through the night. Um, and uh, obviously the team that won, there was the team that, that, that got the most number of laps. And, and it just took off in, in 96. This was on the streets of Dubai. Mm -hmm. uh, having these celebrities over were hugely uh, beneficial. But it attracted uh, not just an expat audience, but also very much an, an Emirati. And, and over the years uh, with the karting, the, I took these races to Oman. We took them to Bahrain, to Abu Dhabi, but they were mainly held in Dubai. And that's really where, you know, we were the home of motorsport, if you will. I mean, it's weird to think that a go-kart facility was effectively the home of motorsport in the Middle East. But, right. you know, when there was nothing when, else, there was nothing else. Mm -hmm. and so yes. we every year Autosport magazine would come out and put in a team. We had Formula One drivers. So we had Damon Hill, Pedro Lamy or driving Damon used to come out regularly. Uh, we had the pop stars from Take That. They used to come out and participate. So they were very high profile events. Right. Uh, and bear in mind, we didn't have social media uh, yeah. in those days. Uh, they were all word of mouth and, and extremely social popular. Media. So I love it. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Well, that's a great well, one. Now, was, it, so you, you did this obviously several years and, you know, before you sort of, I guess, uh, the, the Dubai Autodome came into the picture. Mm. Um, yes. And I'm assuming a bit like almost the way you're describing it because of, you know, being really the only thing there is happening in motorsports, I guess it got you into conversations in the larger motorsports industry, right, with Formula One and others. Because I remember when we first met, and this is probably 20 years back as well now, we were mm. talking about, I think, McLaren at that time where, you know, you were yeah. doing some work with these guys. on, And, and so was that then maybe you, after a while you realized, hey, there is obviously big sponsors here in the Middle East, which are, you know, looking for things, whether it's Emirates or others. Um, and then, you know, putting your advertising head back on or, or how did that kind of evolve further? You know, talk us through that a bit. Yes. Look, I mean, with, with the karting, you know, we were the focus of anybody who used to come to Dubai in the motorsport world would come and see me and come and have a chat. And, and there was no secret at that time that there was a lot of desire to bring Formula One to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. and, and Dubai was the obvious city. Um, and, the, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, once being asked to look after Jackie Stewart, who came to see me. And, and Jackie was out in Dubai. He just started Stuart racing. And I'll never forget, we, he, was, he was waiting to see uh, His Highness to talk about Formula One. 
Um, and I remember taking him to to the tennis event here, and and I remember we were pulling up at the tennis event, and and his phone, his mobile phone went, which was a huge huge brick in those days. We didn't have small phones. Just when mobile phones were coming out, and Jackie said, "I've got to take this call. It's my son calling. We've just started testing." and and I'll never forget, you know, it was the first testing session for Stuart Racing, and and he came off the phone and said, "Oh, we've just, you know, Jan Yang Magnuson was, was was driving in those days, you know, Jan Jan had a uh, you know uh, a crash, and uh, you know he was uh, he was just obviously his son was informing, mm. you know, it was amazing to be sort of part of that, and and that was just the privilege I had by running this only motorsport facility. So look. The the ruling family in Dubai obviously uh, not as passionate about cars as they are about horses at the time, but they they had an audience and and actually they did announce that uh, they were going to bring Formula One to Dubai. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was in the nineties, and and there was a three there was a bid for that and and all that you know they basically went out and said look we're going to provide the land and we we want somebody to come in and bring Formula One and build the circuit and manage it and the likes of Brands Hatch and, and other circuits and, and consortiums got together to bid to bid for, for bid for this project and uh, they used to come and talk to me about it because there was a you know what would be my opinion about it. And, and at the end of the day, unfortunately, when they actually worked out that actually it was going to, you know, it needed more financial support from here and d- providing the land wasn't going to be sufficient to to build a track and bring Formula One, it needed a bit more support, you know, it fell apart. And, and you know, at that time, uh, I do know, and it's a true story that, uh, which was confirmed to me many years later, that at that time, uh, Jackie uh, was very uh, closely connected uh, with the Crown Prince of Bahrain, um, and, and and met him on a you know and on a plane I think it was and and we talked about Formula One and and they basically you know agreed to, he would agree to support him to try and bring a race to Bahrain and that's why the first ever Grand Prix was was hosted uh, you know in Bahrain and it was done with the permission really you know of Dubai Dubai said they would not interfere they would allow them to have this race and go ahead and would not compete and and so what I did. And what leads on to the Dubai Oil Drum is that, you know, having built up a strong racing karting business, there was a massive desire, you know, in Dubai for a club racing circuit, not a Formula One track, but a club racing track that that, that people could go from go-karts into saloon cars and single-seaters for the first time. Right. And, and that's when I came up with the idea of the Dubai Autodrome and Business Park and, and uh I tried to secure, and I initially went to the government for the land, and, and they made it very clear we're not interested in in motorsport and land, and you know we 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 wanted Formula One. It's not happening. But I was just advised to go and try and do it, you know, with a developer, and and at that time the CEO of a company here, one of the biggest uh, probably developers in the UAE, a company called Union Properties, mm-hmm. uh, the CEO used to spend a lot of time at the indoor karting uh, with his young kids at the time they used to enjoy coming to to race when they were youngsters they now turned out to be you know karting superstars over here but but th- when they were kids they started off on the indoor track and it was one saturday morning i went out to see uh, simon who was the ceo and i said look simon i've got a great idea and i think we should we we could do this together i said you know i, I want to build a motor racing track i want to run a motor racing track and i want to you know, develop it here in Dubai, a club racing circuit. And I think it's a great idea, you know, if you develop all the land around the racing track mm. and bring in the automotive industry and bring in the, you know, the testing facilities and et cetera. For, yeah. And we basically, he loved the idea. Uh, and to cut a long story short, we ended up doing this together. Uh, he convinced the board. We got the land. Uh, Union properties were given the land by the Dubai government to develop uh, the Autodrome, and that's when we broke ground. And, um, you know, I, I got, had the track uh, designed by uh, a very old friend of mine called Clive Bowen. This was his first yeah, motor racing Clive. track. That, <laughs> Clive very well from Apex. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Clive had never designed a motor racing track before. He, he'd worked... Uh, at West Surrey Racing, he was a passionate, you know, single seater guy. He loved cars. He was a petrol head. He always wanted to design a track, and I gave him the opportunity oh, to right. design design the Dubai Autodrome. And it, and when we when we were commissioned to build it, I I managed to keep him as the chief designer, and he he worked for for Union Properties, and we and he did, he's designed a you know the Autodrome was a world class track. Mm. Sadly, it didn't quite go to plan for a number of reasons. Tell us. And 
Okay, so first of all, the club circuit became a Formula One spec circuit. So it went from being a 3.6 kilometer circuit to a five and a half kilometer circuit built to Formula One specifications. Uh, The pit garages went from being just very basic garages for uh, club racing to garages that could host uh, a Formula One Mm. Grand Prix. And at that time, it was funny, this is how I can can confirm to you the story about Bahrain, is that uh, Bernie called. Bernie called me when we were when we were building the autodrome, we obviously got out into the press. We, we were exhibiting at Autosport International in Birmingham. And Bernie called and he said, Paul, why are you building a motor racing track in Dubai without Formula One? It, you're wasting your time. You've got to bring Formula One. And I said to Bernie, I said, I understand, but you know, we're a property developer. We're building a motor racing track. We can't afford to bring Formula One, but we're happy to, to convey this message to the government. And if they want to take you up, then that's fine because we're building the facility. And if they don't, that's it. And the chairman of Union Properties communicated with the government and said, look, we have this opportunity. We've been approached by Formula One, despite the Bahrain track being built or almost finished at that time. Would Dubai uh, be still interested in hosting F1? And the the message that came back said, no, uh, we've made a commitment to Bahrain. Carry on, build your Dubai Autodrome, but we're not interested to bring Formula One to Dubai. And that really confirmed for me that it was very much an understanding that Bahrain, that hadn't hosted any major sports event in the world before right. Formula One, really took the uh, took the lead on Formula One and, and and Dubai. We just you know we were given permission to build the racing track, but not worry about the actual Grand Prix. So. We built an F1 spec track, huge budget, uh, without Formula One, and that was a mistake. Mm. The second mistake was we never secured the uh, the free zone status that was very important to me to enable the automotive industry in the Middle East to move uh, their headquarter buildings mm. to the Dubai Autodrome. So Dubai is very fortunate that all the global automotive manufacturers have their regional HQs in Dubai, right. not the dealers, but their HQs. So yeah. the likes of General Motors and Ford and Porsche and Audi, they're all based in Dubai. It's where their regional execs sit, right. and then they travel around. And they had some of them had you know huge offices, lots of people, and but they were working out of different free zones from Jebel Ali to the airport free zone, in different locations. And we offered them the opportunity. I went to see all of them before the autodrome. And we and they were all very interested in in signing up, taking some land, and building their own facilities uh, around the autodrome. And unfortunately, because the free zone status did not come through, we were not able to convert that into actual you know plots being sold and and, and buildings being erected. And and therefore, you know, that was a big disappointment. And then thirdly, really, you know, as you know, Marcus, you know, when you're when you're hosting, you know. Uh, motorsports, motorsports. You know, when you're bringing international racing there, um, it costs money. And you know, when you're a property developer, you're there in the property business. You're there. You're expecting promoters to come in to bring these international races, and 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 that was never forthcoming because there really isn't a grassroots motorsport industry as, as such. And there certainly weren't there in the in the early two thousands. Hmm. Um, so Interesting. Now, I built now, the track. Yeah, I built the- exactly. How did you then handle okay, it over? Sorry. Because I do remember at one point in time, IMG, I think, was involved as well, right? Weren't they sort of one of the uh, – they kind of ran parts of it or some of the marketing side of it? Or am I mixing it up? I think – I don't recall IMG in uh, being involved in those days. But what happened was we built it. We uh, I opened it. had an amazing opening where I got the Et- Et- and Senna's family, uh, Vivian, his sister – to come over from Brazil. We did a massive charity auction um, of some of it and center stuff. We had an amazing gala dinner. Uh, we had uh, some of the drivers were in Bahrain about to race. So we had one Pablo Montoya came over with his wife. And as I said, we we got the whole center family over and, and a lot of the motorsports world. And it was a very successful uh, dinner and launch. And that weekend we hosted, it was called the World – it was a GT, World GT Championship where they had the World Touring Cars. Mm-hmm. They had the, the GTs. They had uh, a whole series of – it was a, it was a race car. It was organized by Stefan Rattel at SRA. It was a very successful weekend of racing to launch the Autodrome, and that was it. And then I decided, you know, that it was time to move on. I, I wasn't going to be needed to run the circuit. We developed uh, – you know, we developed it. We'd handed it over to – 
We'd hired an operator uh, out of Silverstone. We had two guys that used to run Silverstone that, you, that came over to right. to run it. And and then Union Properties decided that you know it was best that they were going in a different direction. And it was that it was at the time, Marcus, when Dubai was. You know, everything was the biggest and the best and the largest. And, uh, mm. you know, it was uh, we built a racing track and and that was that. And and I decided that um, it was time to go and do something on my own and capitalize on on my motorsport knowledge of the region from from the 90s and, and then building the Dubai Autodrome and the contacts I had. And and that led me into sports marketing global. Yeah, correct. So um, uh, now just a uh, last last one on this to one quick one. Um, what is. What what kind of races is uh, the Motodrome uh, or Autodrome now hosting at the moment? I mean, you know, we're now 15 years later, almost or 20 years later. Uh, you know, what is it sort of really what uh, you know what is currently being running there? Uh, what type of competitions you see? Well, sadly, it's a, sadly it's a little bit of a white elephant. To be honest with you, um, there are no there are no races going on there um, right. other than they they host once a year at the beginning of January uh, an international 24 hour race which is huge it's massively successful uh, all the teams come from Europe there are 70 80 cars on that track mm. it, it's an amazing spectacle of racing and it's hosted you know uh, in, in, it wasn't hosted this year obviously but the it's a it's a hugely successful event that's been going i think now for at least 10 years maybe longer and that's it. Apart from that, in, in, in the beginning of January, in the first half of January, there are no other international races on that track since the first weekend. They had one weekend of it. Do you remember A1, mm -hmm. which yes, was the A1 yeah, VP yeah, that A1 was conce that conceived out of Dubai? Uh, they had a race here on the track. And then the weekend that I did. And then, to my knowledge, apart from these 24-hour races once a year, there has been no international motorsport. We've launched a sort of, well, we, I say that they've launched a sort of some grassroots racing. So there's been some radical championships, some um, single seater championships, uh, some some saloon cars and even bikes, uh, motorbikes called sort of a uh, UAE uh, motorbike uh, championship, but not attended. And at the moment, you know, very quiet. The driving school up there is is really non-existent. We used to have Audi in there. They've pulled out. So I think they're looking for a manufacturer really not I don't believe there's much activity the success of the autodrome actually is the go-karting facility so they built separately on the other side a, a fabulous outdoor circuit and indoor and that is busy uh, and, and ironically it's run by by people by the kids that used to work for me when I did the indoor karting in the 90s they've all yeah, sort of yeah. grown up and They've come back and they're ru they're running all the karting up there, and they do and they do twenty four hour races. And occasionally I go up there and and have a laugh and and walk around. And they say, when are you going to do another street race? Because it's a bit dull because the races are on the circuit. It's the same circuit, you know. That there's no atmosphere, yeah, too big, and there's no celebrities, and there's no and. But because Dubai being Dubai, and when the Formula One drivers pass through. You know, they all go up to the to the autodrome, to the go-kart track, to the kartdrome. And, you know, you're constantly see a stream of of current Formula One drivers. Lando Norris was there recently. Uh, Fernando Alonso spends a lot of time up there. You know, they all go and go-kart um, up, uh, up at the autodrome. And that is the successful part of the whole project. But the main track, sadly... Is very under, very underutilized. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, we'll leave that uh, for someone else to figure out because uh, we still got a mm. bunch of other things we wanted to cover here. Um, but it's an interesting learning experience. Um, uh, I'll definitely take some notes because we were we we're looking at we were looking at some things related to uh, a racetrack here in the region as well, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, we'll need to compare them some more notes here. Now, but let's let's talk quickly a bit about Sports Marketing Global, which uh, is really then the company you set up. Um, Digging deeper Ooh. into motorsports and just give us a couple of stories here of what it is, what you were doing. Uh, was it very sponsorship focused or what was it really? What, what was sort of your main focus uh, during those years? Yeah, look, I was very, I mean, I wanted to set up my own business. I, I wanted to come out, you know, working with Union Properties was a different experience for me. It was very much back in, in the corporate world. Uh, and I wanted to set up my own business, and I and I wanted to use the the, the network um, uh, that I developed uh, over the last ten years with the karting and, and with the autodrome project. And I was very privileged in that to get to know, you know, a lot of the people in Formula One, and in particular, built up some 
friendships with with the likes of McLaren and with Williams and and Ferrari and um, and Jordan at the time. So I decided to, you know, I left. I said I wanted to do something on my own. Um, I had some ideas, and I I needed some backing. And I phoned phoned an old friend of ours. Um, you remember Marcus, old friend of ours called Chris Akers of course. Um, uh, from Sports Resource Group. Phoned Chris in London. We got to know each other at that time. And uh, I said, Chris, I'm, I'm going to set this business up. I've got a few ideas. I need £100,000. I think it was at the time to set it up. Uh, would you be interested in coming in as a partner and making that a shareholder loan? And, and literally the next day, £100,000 showed up in my bank account in Dubai. I was able to form the company Sports Marketing Global, and and very, I was very lucky and able to yeah, yeah. to repay. I forgot Chris. about that. Chris was part of it, uh, but yeah, now you're like, refreshing my memories here. Yeah, <laughs> Chris, of course, at the time was managing Robert Kubica. Yeah, you know, he he'd been financing Robert, and uh, Chris was doing a lot of things around. You know, he come out, he come out of football. He was doing a lot of things around the edges of Formula One and, and supporting drivers. Um, and Robert was one of his uh, his guys. And um, he was buying up businesses in Formula One as well. Um, anyway, he backed me. He said he absolutely believed in in what we could do together in the Middle East. He wasn't an active partner. Uh, he was really he, he he supported me when I asked him as a friend, mm. and I was very lucky to be able to repay Chris. You know, within I think it was amazing. We, we, within a year, we we did our first deal, um, and that first deal uh, was um, it was a, it was a strange one. It was a gap year in Formula One with McLaren between. Uh, their title sponsorship. They were with uh, the cigarette company West, mm-hmm. and they signed a deal with uh, with Vodafone to become the title sponsor. Right. Uh, a, a, a couple of years later, there was a lot of urgency to get tobacco out of Formula One, and and West decided to to come off the car a year early before Vodafone were going to go on. So there was this gap year that was partially financed. So. There was a, an opportunity with McLaren to bring in a title sponsor, but not at title sponsorship rates mm. because it was effectively funded by uh, the, the holding company for West. Right. And um, and I took this as an opportunity. I, I, I'd had a good so had who a very did you, good relationship. Who did you bring in? I brought in Emirates. Emirates, um, okay. So Emirates, the first time they ever went into, into Formula One was uh, in 2006 on the McLaren car. And... I built up a very strong relationship with the um, with the head of marketing for um, for McLaren, Ekram Sami, is a, yep. a good friend, still is today. And, and, and Ekram um, had decided sort of to change the look of the car and, and make it a two tone car. It was a, basically it was a, it was a silver and red car, which was mm. going to lead into Vodafone. And with Emirates colours being red, you know, Emirates was the perfect uh, perfect sponsor. They he was. Uh, very keen not to create what he used to describe as a sort of a supermarket of brands on the car with different colours. Yeah. So he, he, if you were a sponsor in those days, uh, the only red on the car was Emirates, and everything else was in black. Mm. And 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 that was an interesting approach. Obviously, very attractive to Emirates when I presented it to them. So I I contacted. Uh, Ekram and I said, "Look, I have an idea. He, he he wanted to fill this position. He we spoke about Emirates, and I said, leave it with me.' And uh, we produced some amazing visuals uh, together, uh, McLaren and I, and blew them up as as big as you could possibly could. Uh, and then I went into uh, and 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 took them into Emirates, and I went right to the top. I went to see Tim Clark, who's the the CEO and still is today, uh, Sir Tim Clark now, and." And he looked at me and he said, um, you know, I've got no interest in Formula One. He said, it, for me, it's it's like postage stamp uh, sponsorship. You know, we're much, I much, much prefer to be around, you know, the sides of a football pitch or something big and grand and being having a little logo on a Formula One car that, that was racing at 300 kilometers an hour and you're never going to see anything was, did, was not going to be of interest. But when I showed him these visuals, you know, with the back of the car with Emirates on and the red down the sides and uh, how it stood out, mm. uh, very cleverly uh, designed, we convinced Emirates. And, and obviously the price was right and Ekram came out and we negotiated this and yeah, and we took we took Emirates into Formula One for the 2006 okay. season. Right. It was a one-off year. It was a one-year thing because Vodafone were coming in, in from 2007. Mm. Um 
And it wasn't a particularly successful year that year with McLaren. We had a few podiums, but we didn't win any races, unfortunately. But it was the start of really of, of me working closely with McLaren and being a force, I guess, in the Middle East in terms of, of being able to take, you know, take drivers, take, you know, sponsors and drivers and et cetera into that world. And it was, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great year, uh, 2006. And I, I, I really, I really enjoyed it. Actually, <clears throat> The very first race that year wasn't in Australia. It was, I think, it was the Commonwealth Games, and so the very first race uh, was actually in Bahrain. Uh, and the title sponsor of that race was Gulf Air, and James Hogan was running Gulf Air in those days. He subsequently moved to Etihad, and the titles, you know, the title sponsor of uh, and their biggest competitor in the region being Emirates was on the McLaren car. And Boutros in those days loved to have the Emirates stewardesses uh, in the paddock mm. um, around the car. And we got a call. Um, I remember that we got a call uh, on the practice day to say that uh, complaining from Gulf Air that uh, that our stewardesses, our Emirates stewardesses, had to stay in the McLaren garage uh, and were not allowed to walk around the, the circuit and the paddock as though they were sponsoring the race because it, actually it was a Gulf Air race uh, and Emirates' territory was the McLaren. Aaron Garage, and that was quite funny because it was a deliberate ploy, I think, you know, just to uh, to wind them up. But yeah, that was yeah. our start. I mean, and Emirates yeah. obviously is still in F1, or, or obviously then upgraded well, they, right? they, several years later and now become out. a big global yeah. partner. So they came out in 2007 and, and really, you know, they had a great year, a great deal. They, they weren't going to be the title sponsor with McLaren after that. And then the prices obviously changed. So 10 years later, must have been at least 10 years later, they decided to come back into into the world of Formula One, but not on a team uh, as the official airline yeah, and, exactly. and be a sponsor of uh, on the circuits. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think and they've done that 2013, very, very well. I was just looking it up here, actually. 2013, and yeah. they just renewed to 222. So again, obviously, maybe yeah. your, your early entry or, or, or giving him a first taste uh, – Clearly, looks like uh, you know bore some fruits here, uh, and it's still in there, which yeah. is great. And of course, you know now yeah. you have Abu Dhabi a race, and there's Abu Dhabi Airline is in there as well. So clearly, the the airlines yes. in the region have been uh, very heavy supporters of of Formula One in many ways. Formula One, indeed. Yeah, that was the first 2006. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There was a gap, and then they've come back in again in a big way and mm -hmm. and successfully, yeah. successfully. Interesting. Now, uh, any anything else you wanted to sort of. Uh, any, any highlight on, on, on what you did there with Sports Marketing Global or we want to move on to the then how you got into the world now of Arena Group because A, that's uh, really where you spend your last now almost uh, 10, 11 years um, there and, and I definitely want to touch on that unless there's some you know, great story we're missing maybe there in the sports marketing world. Um, you know, because again, t talk me through after, you know, you're obviously running um, Sports Marketing Global and uh, and then I think you see an opportunity there with Harlequin Marquis, where I believe you mm. you bought something or or brought in yeah. uh, Arena Group together, and so you know, and that's a very again very different business than you were in at that time. So uh, where does very that much. coming from, and and did you just see the opportunity, or how did that all come together? Yeah, well, it was uh, look, I was very happy with sports marketing, and and when I got the call from Harlequin, it was uh, it was a surprise. But I, there is a story that links the, the two actually, and mm. and actually sort of concludes my not my career, but certainly what I was doing at, at sports marketing, and and it was in um, two thousand and seven when I ironically was invited to. Uh, the first Abu Dhabi uh, Golf Championships, which is an event, the arena we have been building, you know, since then, mm -hmm. um, or since 2008, I should say. But in 2007, <clears throat> I was a guest at, there in in the marquees, in the structures, <clears throat> at the first Abu Dhabi Golf Championships. When I was introduced to uh, somebody very senior in the Abu Dhabi government, His Excellency. You know, Khaldun Mubarak, who is, is more well known now as the chairman of Manchester City, but very much representing, you know, Abu Dhabi Inc. And I met Khaldun, didn't think anything of it at the Abu Dhabi Golf Championships, which has become a big part of my new life. And the next day I received a telephone call from His Excellency's office to say he would like to have a meeting with me. And when I come down to Abu Dhabi and I drove down <clears throat> and I walked in and there was a lawyer and himself there. And he said, I'm about to tell you something very confidential, Paul. I'd like you to sign this NDA and then we can talk. So I signed the NDA. I was fascinating, fascinating <laughs> to hear what he had to say. And uh, when the lawyer left, he turned around. And he said, um, I've been told 
pleasure meeting yesterday, but I've been told that you are the man when it comes to Formula One, that you know everything about Formula One. He said, I know nothing about Formula One, um, but I want to bring a Formula One race to Abu Dhabi. All right. And uh, and I was shocked. I said, oh, he said, and uh, by the way, I'm not just telling you that I want to bring a Formula One race. I have already met uh, with Bernie uh, mm. several times. I was introduced. So at that time, uh, Mubad, the Abu Dhabi government, had bought uh, a stake uh, in Ferrari, Ferrari, the company, yeah, not, the, the, not the Formula One, but the whole company had 10% Correct. or something. Mm. Um, and uh, Luca de Montezemolo, the then chairman of Ferrari, had introduced Caldoun to, to, to Bernie, and it basically set that initial discussion up. Yeah. And Caldoun had called me down because it was now at the stage where he needed somebody to go in and negotiate uh, the contract to bring it to... Well, at to, least he hadn't Africa. signed it yet. That's a start. Normally, they always sign it, and then they come and go, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can you help no, me? I'll no figure signature. This out. <laughs> he said, I need you with the lawyers to go to London and negotiate the contract and the rights for uh, us. Uh, cool. You know, I agreed everything. We're going to do it. We've got the permission. Bahrain had said, yes, it can come to do uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, Aldar were building the track on Yaz Island, and he asked me to go in and negotiate really the commercial side, yep. the commercial rights. I'm not a lawyer, and I worked with two of his lawyers, and we spent the whole of that year, the rest of that year, going back and forth to London, where we uh, eventually signed a seven-year deal to bring Formula One to Abu Dhabi from 2009, nice. and the rest is history. Yep. So I was very happy. Having done that, I was super happy. I received a telephone call from my my brother-in-law at the time, my brother-in-law who had set up a company called Harlequin in 1999 as a very upmarket English marquee company with huge gap here. And he wanted to sell his business and and he wanted help. And he called me and I said, I'm really not interested. I'm having a great time with my sports marketing business. I've just been working with Ferrari. I've just done the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And he said, please have a look at my business. And I had a look at it. I went to London to meet up with Arena, who had interestingly the year before had expressed an interest to buy the business, which he turned down. And I said, look, if I take over this business, would you come in with me? Um, are you still interested uh, to come back to the table? And they said, yes, it will be on different terms. And I went back to my brother-in-law, Charlie, and I said, look, I'll give you some advice. You, you're selling this business too early. You need to, to wait a couple of years. We just come through, you know, the collapse of Lehman and the world, the big recession, and it was a bad time. And uh, he said, no, I've made up my mind. I'm going to South Africa. I need you to take the business over. And that's what happened. And then I thought, I can still do my sports marketing, but I love the challenge of this business because Arena, and has been, as you know, been going for hundreds of years, is very well known globally now uh, for designing and delivering uh, iconic sports events mm. around the world. You know, from Wimbledon, we've been building Wimbledon for 30 years, the Ryder Cup for the same period, the Open, the Grand National, through to the Super Bowl in the States, um, the PGA Tours, uh, and then obviously through uh, to what we've uh, what we've been building and designing and delivering over in the Middle East and Asia. And I saw the opportunity with the arena, my background in sports, the opportunity to uh, take Harlequin into a new world of sports uh, with the backing of Arena uh, and using my contacts. And, and the first race we, we built was obviously the 2009 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. It was a huge opportunity. And I we did the deal. And I, I, <clears throat> I ended up buying the company with Arena and we bought half. And we had an earn out with the founders. We At the time, the business had you know 30 or 40 people in Dubai, it was just Dubai. We had no presence anywhere else in the Middle East or Asia. Right. It was the first acquisition of Arena outside of the UK. Up until 2009, it was just an English company. Mm. And yeah, I started my, my journey of the last 12 years, as, as I was reminded this morning on LinkedIn. Uh, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, and like I said, I mean, you know, I, I did a little bit of homework, obviously, you know, you know look, checking out the website and the company is, was founded, at least according to what I read there, in 1761, which makes it 260 years now. I didn't even know there were mm. events at that time um, or, or yeah. <laughs> something uh, which would require this sort of service. But, you know, I'm sure as usual, it has evolved over the years. But um, and like you rightly said, you know, initially, or at least over the last several years, um, I would argue it's really grown by acquisition, right? Um, and part of that, of course, was also the public listing 
which uh, mm. I got that right somewhere about 2017. Is that about correct? correct. Um, when you guys yeah. listed yes. on Ames, right? And yes. obviously you raised you know a bunch of money, 60 million pounds, I guess. Um, you know, and then it sort of hit 100 million pound revenue in 2018, and uh, so you know that's that's a proper business. Um, but yes. Uh, yes. you know, and again, you obviously played that sort of I guess Middle East and slash Asia Pacific role, right? Because um, I remember you coming into yes. KL and, and in Asia. Here. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We do. We have a big presence in Asia. Absolutely right. And that's where we kind of reconnected again, because, um, you know, I was I, I took we, we then obviously changed the Harlequin name, that brand to Arena. We grew. We, we set up in Abu Dhabi. We we then made our first acquisition uh, in Asia, in, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur with Asia Tense uh, on the back of winning some major golf tournaments over there. And now, you know, we are you know, we were pre covid, you know, uh, close to to 300 staff you know, in the Middle East uh, and Asia, 350 if you, you know, in the Middle East and Asia, we, with offices from Hong Kong to Seoul to Malaysia. Uh, we have a, a joint venture in Japan because we're doing a lot of work on the Olympic Games. Mm. Uh, and then back into the Middle East with Saudi now sort of opening up massively over the last few years. So, we, we, and we have a presence there. So, yeah, the company... When I took over the company, and we, as the we we were the we were three divisions. We were Arena Americas, Arena UK and Europe, and Arena Middle East and Asia. And we, up until 2019, the Middle East and Asia were always the smallest in the group. We were the small. We we, we could never get ahead of the US. We the UK was dominant. And in 2019, we on the back of a, of, of some huge projects in Saudi Arabia. We became the biggest division and the most oh, profitable yeah, division awesome. in the arena group in 2019 and delivering some fantastic work. And and that was just before COVID. Yeah, so, and all hell broke loose. And, and well, I definitely want to touch on that a little bit uh, because, again, uh, but before that, I, I'm not sure yet we've done a, a good job yet to even explain all the things Arena does. Um, you know, and again, I always assume there's always people who might not know you guys that well. Um, you know, on the website it says it's an integrated event solutions provider, um, but that mm. means mm. there's many things to this, right? And you know, and as you earlier mentioned already, from Wimbledon to tennis and golf and and, and other uh, major events, Olympics, etc., you you guys come in there. And if I would define this in my ter my words, and you add please to it, um, you really are in the sort of temporary structure business, right? You provide services from seating to uh, full services. Um, you know, if you go to a golf event, I guess you. Have the big marquees mm. there where you do everything from mm. the catering to the you know to 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 other parts um you know i think you're doing some things in the ice skating world you have mm -hmm. you know bars you mm. can hire and you know art exhibition etc right so that's sort of the world you're in right it's always it's an event world right something is happening and someone needs a temporary or even i guess more permanent structures that's when guys like you guys rock up and and deliver it is that be correct yeah, we, exactly. We're in the event services business. Right. So we don't manage events. We don't organize events. We don't yeah. promote events. We design and build them. I like to call it, Marcus, my new wording is, I like to call it temporary event architecture. All right. So we are in the temporary architecture business. We, uh, yeah, in many cases, we're a commodity rental company. So we have 160,000 seats in the world. So we're building, you know, seating solutions at, at all the major sporting events, grandstands, temporary grandstands. So, for example, in London 2012, when we're doing the same in Tokyo, um, we're building the Beach Volleyball Stadium, which is a 15,000-seater temporary stadium with the, with the Beach Volleyball pitch. That's what we do. We then have the temporary structures, which, as you say, is the marquees. And today, marquees can be single deck, triple deck, uh, and in some cases, a triple deck with even a roof terrace. Yeah. Um, we've gone into temporary structures. We're now into modular buildings and decking systems. So because people, perhaps they don't want a tent overlooking their golf course, they want a, a very cool glass box overlooking the course. So we've, we've sort of branched out into modular buildings. And then we do the interiors. So we design all the hospitality experiences. We provide the furniture. Uh, we fit it out. We do the air conditioning if required. Um, you, you provide and then the people too? Are you, you like the, who, the we provide, we, No, we don't do the catering. We don't do the security. So what we do is we do all the furniture. We do the tabletop. So we do the glass, the, the cutlery, the linen, 
and for the caterers. And then we hand it over. So what we do is we hand over Wimbledon uh, on the day of the channel, day before the championships. We enjoy it. OK. And then after the championships, they give us the keys back uh, and we remove it all in a sustainable way. Right. Um, and, and that's what we have been doing for many years. And, and that's the business that I've extended in the last 12 years uh, from a standing start across the Middle East and Asia. And, and, and now, obviously, you know, our big new market being uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So let's uh, let, let's dive into, you know, you just said 2019 was a big year, uh, especially for your region, yeah. right? Uh, in Saudi, of course, as uh, you know, uh, it's growing like crazy in, in many areas. Uh, you know, F1 is now going there as well uh, as, I guess, the third race in the region. Uh, but then COVID hit, you know, and it means, you know, we all know events pretty much stopped all around the world. And even the ones which did happen, it was there was no spectators, which is partly what you guys are building, too. Right. You're building the hospitality and where people are supposed to be sitting and eating and, and spending a lot of money on. So just talk us through for what happened here now. Let's call it the last year plus um, since this happened. You know, how did you guys were able to react to it, um, you know, with 1200 people around the world? And of course, you know, some fairly significant um sunk cost right that equipment and that all those things are yeah. sitting there right and if they if they're not being used uh you know i'm sure there's you know also a cost always which incurred so you know talk us yeah. through this from your perspective of you know how to, how covid has affected the business and, and how you were able to deal with it yeah so 2019 as you rightly say was a hugely successful year for us particularly in this part of the world in the middle east because we've come off the back of the anthony joshua a Ruiz mm. fight that yeah, we built yeah, yeah, yeah. Which in, in, in Riyadh, which was absolutely huge and a global event. Uh, and on the back of that, that was in November. We cut. We we came off that hugely successful year. We started to to build the uh, the, the what we call the the European Tour Desert Swing with the Abu Dhabi Golf Championships and Desert Classic and Saudi. Mm. During the time that COVID was was already affecting our Asian business, and, and it was going to be, it was it was very clear that our business was going to be decimated. Um, and you know, as they say, we events were the first to go, and generally speaking, are the last to come back. Sadly, and you know, we we had to pivot. Uh, effectively, we had to pivot our business away from being reliant on events which were cancelled and postponed immediately, yeah. to where could we use our equipment? You know, what what could we use our structures? For what we we couldn't use our seating really, but where could we use our our structures? Where could we use our ice uh, boxes that we had in the UK? You know, where what could we do? And so we pivoted into that non-event world and and got stuck into uh, supporting the medical uh, profession in building uh, screening centres, temporary oh, hospitals, oh. sadly temporary morgues. You know, across the world, uh, the our US business has had huge success over there. Uh, we were able, the same in the UK and, and the same in the Middle East. So yeah. we actually, in the Middle East, I actually, we actually picked up the biggest contract uh, in a long time in, in April 2020 when we were commissioned to build a temporary medical holding facility uh, in Dubai. Mm. Um, and we had to build it in a month. And, and they could only use tents. And so we had to build it. We had to fit it out and basically... Uh, create 300 hospital bedrooms. Uh, and I then remember had we had a couple of calls bedrooms. on that one. <laughs> we did, because I was short of hospital beds. And I was That's doing right. things that, I, you know, there was a huge run on hospital beds. And, you, and I think you were in the mask business at the time or something. Um, and we were looking for hospital beds. We actually managed to get them in the end. But it was a it was a massive uh, it was a massive challenge, and that's basically what we had to do as a business. We pivoted. Yeah. Um, we we also pivoting. as a yes, <laughs> we also as a business were we did a rights issue uh, very in the very early very early April. We decided to go out to our shareholders. We knew that uh, this was going to go on for a while. We knew that we needed to to put our company on on a good financial footing, right. and and at the time I had managed to to bring in um, a Saudi family office who were very keen to support us in Saudi, but more importantly, they were very keen on the on the arena brand globally and, and the, what we do at Goodwood and, you know, what we what we do in London. And, and um, you know, there's nothing better than seeing our, our furniture business, well-dressed tables and seeing them deliver to Buckingham Palace. You know, we had a very we have a very good brand and this Saudi family were very keen to to invest and support us. And uh, so we did a rights issue, which they very uh, they kindly underwrote, and and we raised uh, a substantial amount of money to have there to 
to ensure if we if we needed if we needed support, you know, further down the road during COVID, that we had enough resources to be able to trade through it, and and that was a big. Uh, we were the, one of the very few companies that were able to successfully to get a rights issue uh, out of the way, and you know, and uh, you know, in early in early April um, and That's just true. before the COVID, and so that was successful for us on AIM, and then we pivoted, as I said, and and the US and the UK and ourselves, we picked up some some great work, and we've obviously. You know, taking advantage of some of the uh, the, the great support schemes, particularly uh, the UK uh, government. Great to hear. So, that. And, and I have two two points here to it. One is um, um, you mentioned sort of that that was actually just before all this happened. I think you were in the process of trying to buy out or or, or take over the business or take it back private again. Yes, indeed. Um, was was that with the same Saudi group or with a or different people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No, absolutely right. So. You know, we, we hadn't had a particularly successful ride on AIM at the time, uh, you know, hmm. 19. It wasn't really, you know, our value wasn't really reflective in, in what we were delivering. Uh, and the group CEO uh, and, and myself came together to make an attempt to take uh, the business private. Right. Uh, and full support of, of a private equity a company out of the U.S., who I, was my last trip before COVID to New York. And, and my our friends in Saudi Arabia, this, this family office, they came together. So we had two excellent partners. We put in a bid. It was accepted. It was a generous bid. Uh, this is all in the public domain. You can read about it. And uh, we were we'd completed the due diligence. We were two weeks away from signing, uh, doing the deal, and, and dotting the i's and crossing the t's. And we decided at that stage, with COVID looming, that this would not be the right thing to do. We needed to, to protect the business moving forward. Buying uh, buying a company out was not the right use of funds. So we we called off the the management buyout as it was. Right. The uh, unfortunately the Americans couldn't support the rights issue because they were a private equity and that didn't fit their investment mandate or criteria. Uh, but the Saudis were very keen to still invest and become shareholders. Thank God that they did. They came in. Uh, we did it as I said. We that led to a very successful you know rights issue for our business to, and it's you know put us on a great footing. And and the rest is history. We've come. We're trading through COVID. It's now twelve months. We've pivoted the business. We're minimizing our cash burn wherever possible, and we're we're delighted with Boris Johnson's roadmap to to bring events back. And we're hopeful that this year that you know the likes of Wimbledon will perhaps not be at a full capacity, but perhaps a thirty percent uh, capacity, and the Open the same. And we're looking forward to not a normal UK summer of events, but you know certainly. Uh, a lot more normal you, than it was see, last year. You're seeing a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel here, which is actually my, yeah. a bit my question is, you know, the space you're in, I'm sure you guys are following this very closely, you know, how events are coming back. And, you know, again, you mentioned, I think you guys had won some contracts in, in Tokyo as well. Uh, and now, you know, recently they made an announcement that very, un, you know, most likely you will not have foreign or international uh, fans there, right? It may focus just on, I guess, domestic the domestic fans or domestic uh, spectators. Uh, again, all those things do, of course, affect the event business and therefore what they need and how many you know seats and things they need. Uh, what is it really what you see happening? Um, let's take this year for the rest of this year and then going into 222 here, uh, which again is a big sports year, right? With, uh, you know, Winter mm. Olympics and you have, uh, you know, of course, the World Cup in, in Qatar. You know, where, where, how is, what is your best prediction, um, standing where you are and seeing what you see? Well, I think 2021 for our industry is probably going to be a transitional year. You know, I, I think, you know, with the vaccine program being rolled out, you know, successfully, certainly in the UK and pretty aggressively in the Middle East, I, I do feel that, you know, there will be events coming back. So I, it is a transitional year. It's not going to be back to where it was in 2019. Mm. We've we've taken the opportunity to reset our business, uh, to look at areas where, you know, where where perhaps we were we shouldn't be. And we've taken decisions to to take, set, you know, certain parts of our business away. And, and, and we brought in, you know, new new opportunities like the modular stuff that trying to to go to come away from being totally reliant on events and pivot our business into into non-events mm. um and and that sort of takes out the seasonality of events mm. um so we we believe i believe that this year will be transitional i think as we go into 22 23 i'm i'm confident with the commonwealth games in birmingham in 22 obviously that you mentioned the fifa world cup uh next year i'm i'm confident that we the 22 23 will 
hopefully, I mean, our focus is to bring it back to where it was in 2019. And then from 2023 to four, you know, to start to start growing the business again. But I think it's it's a two year to come back to where we were in 19. And we're, we, we've already started. And, and, and that's the sort of, for me, the light at the end of the tunnel in that respect. Interesting. Uh, are you, mm. uh, let, let's talk about, about uh, the region uh, as a whole here, maybe as a sort of last uh, 10 minutes rounding up uh, our uh, interesting discussion we had. Um, you know, Middle East is, you know, you've been there now, as we said earlier, almost three decades, and mm. you've seen it grow from, you know, no one, no F1 race to three races now, and, and you know, mm. biggest the biggest sporting events on in the world coming, including the Football World Cup. Uh, you know, mm. major boxing events. WWE has a deal in Saudi as well, where they bring one of their pay per views there. So I mm. mean, you, you name it. You know, you know, big golf tournaments and tennis tournaments are rocking up there. So, where, what is it? What is it? What you believe um, is, uh, you know, a maybe which are the countries driving it? And Saudi is the obvious, uh, but you know, maybe there's others you see or or looking at that as well. Um, you know, and, and where do you see this this going? Is it again just something which is there because right now it's sort of the flavor of the the year of the months kind of thing, and or is there really, you know, genuine belief that um, you know they want to build something long term there? Um, you know, especially if you take football in Qatar now as an example. Are you guys in, involved in, with Qatar? Are you doing some overlay or other things there? Or? We're certainly we're setting up in Qatar. We found a partner, and we're, we're going to be bidding for some some stuff there, some right. overlay. Stuff there, yeah. But but going back to your point, yeah, very interesting. I mean, events has really been, you know, over the years that I've been here, has been the driver of of the economies. Starting off in Dubai, mm. um, where you know when I first came here, Dubai was the event capital, and 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 events, not just sports events, but you know cultural events, right. exhibitions. You know, it was a massive driver. Uh, right. Of the of the local Dubai economy, I had the expo, um, right? Wasn't that long ago? The, the the expo starts on October the first this year. This is the culmination for Dubai. You know, they they brought the biggest event in the world here. Right. Um, and over the, and, and then it started to be driven certainly in the late two thousands. You know, and, and in the last ten years, very much by Abu Dhabi, and Abu Dhabi with when His Highness, you know, Sheikh Zayed passed away, and the new and, the, and his sons started to take control, and and they want they all also followed an event strategy uh, to grow their, to grow tourism and to grow visitors. And again, you know, they, they built some major uh, attractions in Abu Dhabi, like the Louvre, um, and, and then obviously the Formula One track on Yaz Island. Yeah. Um, the Ferrari, they, they, uh, you know, theme the park. The Ferrari world, yeah. the theme park, all this, Warner Brothers. So Abu Dhabi um, has been a big driver for us uh, in the events industry over the last 10 years and invested a lot of money. Um, and, you know, we've had UFC there, as you know, they've been they've right. invested in UFC. They, yes. they've, they've invested in a, in a Europe, you know, a Tour de France team that won it this year, right. etc. So Abu Dhabi has been very much the driver mm. letting and, and Dubai sort of, you know, settled off. And then in the last couple of years, uh, it's all been about the vision of the, the new, you know, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and the, yeah. and the Saudi 2030 vision, which, again, a large part of that is, is driven by by events um, uh, and uh, not just real estate, but by events. And and you've got some, you know, you've got the Ministry of Sport there that's that's handling the um uh, the sporting events. You've got the General Entertainment Authority that's handling all the the cultural uh, and musical side, and you know that is where uh, the event industry is is really focused on now. Right. And 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 I, that's going to continue for me. That's going to be con continue to drive our industry certainly for the next five years. Uh, the UAE is perhaps more of a mature market now. You know, it's an easy. You know, it's a good place to do business. People like to live here. It, it's got a good event infrastructure. We've got two world-class, you know, O2-type facilities here. We've got the Coca-Cola Arena in Dubai, which is in which is a twenty-thousand-seater indoor arena. We, they've just opened the Etihad one in Abu Dhabi, which is the same size. You know, we're very spoiled here with the infrastructure for events. Right. Saudi is a different landscape. They've got nothing. Everything is temporary. So for us. You that's, know the boxing that's, stadium. Yeah, that's a good thing. Right? It's great. <laughs> good. And the first, the biggest event they're going to host this year is the F1 in Jeddah on the streets. Yep. So at the first street race in this part of the world, which they'll host for I think three years before it goes to a, a permanent circuit in uh, near Riyadh. So that's been launched. December's the race day, and um, 
the event industry, certainly people like myself, were very focused on being part and supporting that event. Mm. You know, we now have uh, set up in, in Saudi Arabia. We have a good partner, as I highlighted. Mm. Um, it's very important if you're going to do business in Saudi Arabia that you're actually established and living and working out of Saudi Arabia. You know, doing business, trying to, to service events or to any business from outside of the kingdom is difficult. You need to you need to have a presence, physical presence, on the ground in Saudi Arabia, and on the sporting side, you know, Arena has been very, very fortunate. You know, the first was the Golf, the European Tour, Saudi International, which we've been building now for the last few years, mm. uh, and Saudi Golf is making a big investment in golf. They've just launched this Aramco Ladies Team Championships across the world. Um, which is launching this year. So there's a lot of investment into golf as a sport. Yeah. Uh, tennis, they're certainly very keen on. Football has always been the main, the main sport there. Boxing, yeah. um, and now and now Formula One. They have Formula E as well. Mm. That's interesting, and I like the word you and you mentioned it a couple of times, and it really has a nice uh, uh, sort of memory for me. There, um, I had an office in Dubai in. I can't even remember, 2008 or nine, in that sort of ballpark, I think. Uh, and we lasted about a year. Uh, and the, the reason we went in, it was the obvious, right? Um, at that time, again, the, the region was booming. Um, we were already had offices across pretty much most of the rest of Asia. So Middle East was an obvious to also you know, stick our nose in there. Um, and as I, and the reason why we pulled out within a year was two things. One is we were coming in with a particular event and, and that just didn't work. But we did not have the local partners. Um, you know, we came in as someone who knew the business. We we knew our stuff. Uh, you know, we were bringing in uh, clearly clever guys. We had a good team of people there, um, but we had absolutely no local relationships, right? You know, we had no one who was really supporting us and 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 open helping us opening doors to us for us. So, to me, that was clear. That would take way too long to, too long, and uh, and therefore I pulled the plug on it very quickly. It was probably the the, the shortest lived office we ever had anywhere. In the world, only my patience is a bit longer for for before things you know come around. Now you mentioned that a few times too, and you've been there for thirty years, right? So you could argue, you know, you were actually on the ground, right? I was having that office running it uh, from from here in from our part of the world here in Southeast Asia. Um, you know how how important is that, and you know, not just for what you're doing yourself, but in, in in general, like you know, having that local relationship and bringing in those that those local the, the people with the local expertise, right? Let's call them that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very important. I mean, when we, we've set up in Saudi now, we we are employing Saudi nationals, and, and they're they're great people, well educated, well spoken. Uh, you know, we, we, you don't have necessarily have to speak Arabic. Everybody speaks English perfectly. It's important to have Arabic speakers on board. Of you know, it's, that's normal. But you know, it's important to you know you to be an expat business is is dated now. You need to you you need to be very much a you know. A local business. Yeah, you know, yeah. you might have an international footprint. You might have an international standards that you bring, um, but you you have to be local. And um, and if you don't have that, uh, you're at a disadvantage. I'm not saying you won't be awarded projects or you won't win work, but you know you are certainly at a disadvantage if you're trying to move in and out of of countries uh, and not set up a proper. Uh, or invest in a proper presence. Do you have local partners in terms of an equity as well? Is that required in the region? Because in some countries no. here in, in Asia, you you can't really own one hundred percent of the business, um, or that's not no. That's region. changed. That's that used to be the rules here, but you can own one hundred percent of your company in the UAE. You can do exactly the same in Saudi. So we okay. we own one hundred percent of our company in the UAE. We own one hundred percent of our company in in Saudi. Our partners are strategic partners. So our our Saudi family office, Tashil, are investors in the holding company in the UK. Right. They're not on. They're not our partners in Saudi uh, directly, but they are indirectly because they are shareholders in the holding company. Yeah. And the same in the UAE. The rules and you know. The governments here have opened up and are allowing people to come in and set up their own businesses and own it a hundred percent. And that, that's sort of the you would argue that's the same across most of the most parts of the region, I guess. Right? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. Look, Paul, uh, that's been a really good, uh, you know, a bit more than an hour here. We're already um, discovering mm -hmm. your background and, and amazing stories about how motorsports in the Middle East started and, and how you were a big part of that uh, with the Dubai Autodome, of course, and, and other deals there from Emirates, etc. And 
then of course getting into the world of uh, arena here uh, which you know continues to grow even though and, and it's great to see, to hear your your honest uh, feedback on that how you know it was impacted uh, and i'm sure i can imagine i have some other friends in the who are very heavy in the events business as well in other parts of the world and it's brutal, I'm sure, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, because you, you're not just dealing with a business. It's, it's a people's business, right? At the end of the day, you're dealing with, you know, people who, the employees and everyone else who, you know, gets their paycheck there. So uh, it's it's tough. So I, I can only uh, congratulate you for how you guys managed to get through it and the, the pivoting you were talking about. Um, you know, all the best for the next, as you rightly said, another year or two, I'm sure, before things maybe yeah. are really back to normal. Um, it isn't quite over yet, as we all know. Things yeah. always kind of yeah. keep to be coming back a bit, you know, what you hear right now in Europe again. So, ah, it, it's not it's not fun, but uh, it, it was fun to have, a you know, a more general conversation, not just COVID discussions here with you. Uh, so thank you yeah. for your time. And uh, I'm sure, again, we'll catch up somewhere again soon, maybe in Saudi for the F1 race or somewhere in Abu Dhabi or Dubai. And uh, have a good one there. Thank you, Marcus. I'm sure we'll see each other at some Formula One race. I know we're both fans. Um, it's been great to chat with you, and, and thank you for inviting me to join. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it. Uh, we'll talk again soon, buddy. Take care. Cheers. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Lure Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Lure. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.